Good evening. Thank you for joining us here at Central Church of Christ for our Wednesday night Bible study. I hope everything's going well for you, that this week has been good and not too crazy. I know it's been nice outside and Bailey and Benji and I have been able to go outside a lot and I hope you all have too and been able to enjoy the creation that God has given us. Uh, I hope tonight you will join with me as we study in our Bibles in the book of Daniel to continue our class from previous weeks. And I hope that it will be beneficial and uh, helpful to you all as it has been to me studying through this book. But before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the time we have to worship together, to study together, to grow our faith together. We pray that you'll be with us in these times, that you'll strengthen us and guide us so that we can continue serving you to the best of our abilities and so that we can glorify you in all that we do. Father, I pray that you'll just be with those among us who are ill or, or just need uh, strength, that you'll strengthen them and heal them and uh, help them to get back on their feet if the need is there. Pray it should be with those of us who are uh, learning to cope with this situation in different ways, that you'll just strengthen us and uh, keep our reliance fully on you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Tonight we're going to continue our study of the book of Daniel as we've been going over it for the past couple of weeks. And tonight what we're going to do, uh, we're going to be studying chapters 3 and 5, which I joined together because they have very similar themes and lessons that we can learn from it. And as we begin, I, I do want to remind ourselves where we are in this story. If you'll recall, last week we studied chapter 2 and chapter 4, which had stories of visions and interpretations of Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 3 picks up a couple of years, maybe a decent amount of years after chapter two. And we see this, what we see in this chapter is that Nebuchadnezzar has built his own statue for all of his kingdom to honor and to worship. And that's where we're going to begin and really understand that Daniel is the story of God's power. Now, when we look at this, this chapter in chapter three, and, and as we look in chapter five, what we're going to see is that as the story is a story of God's power. We're going to see how God's power is all about him rescuing when it seems bleak. Because that's what chapter 3 and chapter 5 are all about. And if you'll look with me in verse 1 of chapter 3. In verse 1 of chapter 3, it says this. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, and bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. We begin this story really with kind of this uh, sad state of affairs in Babylon. If you recall back to chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has made a, a praise or a statement praising God for his power and for his wonders. But here, once we get to chapter 3, it says if he has forgotten all about God or has just disregarded what he's already understood or learned. And maybe that that's what plays into chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar has to go through his own trial to really come to grips or come to an understanding that God is the Almighty Lord in which, who, in which everything flows through and is done by. But here in chapter 3, we do get a sad story of Nebuchadnezzar's understanding. Because the story starts off with Nebuchadnezzar making an idol of gold. Now this idol is very special. And I mean special as in it's, it stands out for, for all the ways it's built and what it's made of. As we see, it's made of complete gold. But it is 60 cubits tall and 6 cubits wide. Which measures to roughly about 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Which is an immense immense statue. And it's one that I think we 
we would be marveling at if we saw it in today. Think of the statues or monuments we have in, in Washington, D.C. Or, or all across the world in Rome or in Germany, where these monuments are made to commemorate wonderful events of, of triumph, of bravery, or, or to commemorate events of, of sadness and uh, misery. We see those things and we marvel at them because they're, they're feats of architecture that can't that in their times shouldn't have ever happened, or we can't wrap our minds around how they happened. Think of the pyramids in Egypt, how we wonder how those were built, how long it took, what, what kind of tools did those builders use? Here in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar is able to build this giant golden statue, and it's amazing. In all st statements of the word, it's, it's something that probably is very beautiful to look at. But that's where the problem begins for Nebuchadnezzar. Because what Nebuchadnezzar does is he commands all the officials to come for this dedication. And we see the list of those who come. The governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, the satraps, the prefects. Really, anybody who's anybody in the government of Babylon is here for this statue. They're here to dedicate it, to praise it, to, to show Nebuchadnezzar all glory for what he's done. And this builds up into what Nebuchadnezzar does. Because Nebuchadnezzar commands a worship before the idol when music is going to be played. All are going to bow down and worship. Everybody of, of language, of nation, of uh, a people, it's, it's anybody who's there is going to bow down before this idol. And it's all at the sound of music. So Nebuchadnezzar has this whole grand ordeal planned that whenever his music plays, People are going to bow down and worship what he has created. Now, what's special or what's noticeable about this is that as he does this, as he commands this, we see in verse 7 that all people are doing this. That every single one of the people in, in uh, attendance are bowing down and worshiping this statue. But we, if we read on, we'll see that that's not exactly the case. In verse 8, it says, Therefore, at that time... Certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, and pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. As we see in verse 7, you know, we, we read that all people were bowing down at the sound of music to this golden image. But that's not the case because there are Babylonians, or, or as it's put, Chaldeans, which are the same thing, accuse Jews who do not worship. They, they come forward to King Nebuchadnezzar and, and proclaim his some praise to him, saying, you're going to live forever. But then they bring forth these, these accusations of Jews who, who aren't doing what he's commanded. And if you look at what they say, there, there may be some reasoning behind this. They call out that there are certain Jews who Nebuchadnezzar has appointed over all the affairs. Maybe there's some jealousy among these Chaldeans for, for the success that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are having. And that's what leads them to accuse, uh, accuse them. Or maybe they just don't like looking over and seeing that not everyone is actually doing what the king says. Maybe they're just uh, looking out for the greater good of the kingdom, so to speak. But the case in point here is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are called out for their lack of worship of this golden image. And when we think back to to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand for, if we think back to chapter 1, how they're with Daniel, when they stand up for the food that they eat and keeping their bodies pure. It makes sense to see that they're the three who are standing up to worshiping an idol instead of God. Now, there are some things we can talk about. We can we can talk about how maybe they, they could have just knelt down and been messing with their sandals or cleaning their, their hem of their tunic and to make it look like they were worshiping when they weren't really. Maybe they were kneeling because, well, maybe we act as if we're worshiping. We're not really. We're saying prayers to God at this time. But that's not what they do. In fact, we'll get to that in a moment. But what we see is that they just do not do this. And it stands out. And it's brought to the attention of the king because Nebuchadnezzar goes on to call these three Jews before him. And he's furious. In verse 13, we see this, that he's in a furious rage and brings them forward. And he asks them the question, well, is it true you guys aren't bowing down to this image that I have set up? 
and it's sad because what we see here is Nebuchadnezzar has pride blinding him that he goes on after asking this he, he says now i'll give you one more chance to bow down at the music and worship this if not you're going to be thrown in this fiery furnace and there in verse 15 at the very end of it we see it where his pride really comes to an a, a a uh climax it says and who is the god who will deliver you out of my hands nebuchadnezzar sees himself as absolute power and he he tells shadrach meshach and abednego here's your one chance Bow down and you'll be saved. If not, I'm going to throw you in this furnace and there's no one who can deliver you from my punishment. Nebuchadnezzar puts these three Jews to the test. He is testing them to, to either proclaim their faith again or obey. And we see in verse 16 that they respond. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. They make their choice. They, they make their choice of, of how to respond to Nebuchadnezzar because they see it as there are no options. There's one option. That option is to stand up for their faith. And that's what they do. They respond with faith. They, they go on to say in verse 17, If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Like I said, there, there is no option for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's one choice, and that's to stand up for their faith. They say with, with complete resolution and, and resolve that there is only one God, and they will continue to worship him. And that God is able to save them out of that fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, Nebuchadnezzar will know that those three Jews will never have bowed down to his gods or to his golden image, and they have remained faithful to their God. This, this faith, this, this bravery, in the face of certain punishment, is amazing. It's a faith that I think we all, all aspire to have. It's a faith that we, we would love to have, that we grow or we try to grow to have. That if someone came to us and said, renounce your faith or, or die, we'd be able to stand up and say, I won't renounce my faith. My faith is all about me. My faith is who I am and why I, I live to do what I, I do. But sometimes that's not the case. I mean, we see time and time in the stories of the Bible, people who recant their faith. We see it with Peter on the day of crucifixion where, where he is denying his faith, that he even knows Jesus three times. We see it, and we know that if Peter does this, we, we know there are so, so many of us who would do the same. That fear would grip us, and we'd fall short. Yet here Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing up in the face of certain doom and saying, no matter what, we're going to continue to serve our God. Now, as the story continues, we see this enrages Nebuchadnezzar again. And he orders the punishment. Not only does he order the punishment, but he increases the heat of the furnace. In verse 19, if you'll read with me, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. The punishment is going to carry, be carried out. In fact, not only is it going to be carried out, but it's going to be intense. Seven times what, it's usually, what it usually would be. And so we see that these three Jews are bound by men of the army. They're, there's no way they can escape, it seems. And they're thrown into the fiery furnace. They, they have to deal with the punishment from Nebuchadnezzar. Now what we see, though, as this story continues, is, is just some more examples of this punishment, how dire it is for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In verse 22, if you'll look with me, it says this, because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. The fire is so hot. The furnace is so uh, overheated that the, th that the mighty men of valor are burned up by just getting close to it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fall into this furnace. That's such a, a, a scary thought. I mean, I, I can hardly wrap my mind around how hot that actually is. 
I mean, I, I think of times where, where I might have had a, a fire outside or, or sat around a fire, and it gets hot if you're really close to it. But to imagine the heat it takes to burn up people who are, are, are walking to deliver those to this punishment. That's a really hot fire, and it's hard to wrap my mind around it. But what we see in this story is that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego fall into the furnace. Something surprises, or nay, something astonishes Nebuchadnezzar in the scene. In verse 24, it says this, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have fallen into the furnace. Yet when Nebuchadnezzar looks into it, and I, we can imagine this is from afar off, when he looks into it, he sees not three figures, but four. And not only are those three figures not burning up or disintegrating, they are walking about in the midst of the fire as if nothing is going wrong as if everything is normal, that they're able to do it without being unhurt, unblemished, unblemished, and that the fourth person in there, even though only three were thrown in, looks like a god. It looks holy, angelic. That shocked and astonished Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't know what to make of it. And so what he does is he calls out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the furnace. He, he calls out and he says in verse 26, Servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and the, saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. Their hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire came upon them. Isn't that amazing? That these three men who were thrown into something that seemed like instant doom, like there was no escape, are saved because of their faith. They're saved because they trusted that their God would rescue them. That he would rescue when it seemed so bleak, when it seemed so dire. And not only did God rescue them, but when they came out of the fire, it was as if they weren't even in there. They didn't have a single hair singed. Their cloaks did not smell like fire. There was not anything burned. Now, I think perhaps the most amazing part of it is that the fact that they didn't even smell like the fire. How hard is it to, to even just walk by a campfire or anything like that and not walk away smelling like you've been standing by a campfire? And yet here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of this furnace, and there's no trace that they've even been around a furnace. That's God's power. That's God not only rescuing, but leaving no doubt that it was God who did it. And this leads to Nebuchadnezzar again praising God and then promoting the three Jews. And verse 28 says, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Now, I know we've seen Nebuchadnezzar do this before. He sees the power of God, and he is amazed. But here, there's some true, true wonder in his voice. He talks about how the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego sets them apart that they would rather have yielded up their bodies than worship someone other than their God. Now, I don't know, or I don't think we're even told if Nebuchadnezzar is yet to reconcile that God is the God, the one and only God. But here he says some things that, that show that their God sets him apart from any of the gods of Babylon. He said that if anyone even says something against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're going to be punished. That not only is it a punishment, but it's a, a painful and scary punishment. They'll be torn limb from limb if someone so much as utters a, a false statement or an accusation against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And again, we, we aren't told that this is where Nebuchadnezzar is able to reconcile and, and truly put his trust in God. In fact, I don't think we see that until chapter 4 when he is forced to go through his own trial and own tribulation. But what we see from this story with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that God rescues when it seems so bleak. 
God rescues when, when it seems like there's nothing else to do but perish. And yet God is there saving his people. And when we think about our own time and how this might apply to us, we may not be faced with our own fiery furnace. A king may not be shoving us into it and punish, punishing us. But think about the times where our faith is tested. Where the only choices, uh, uh, it seems, are to either renounce our faith and live without punishment, or to keep our faith and be punished by, by mocking or, or beating or just being ostracized in society for it. I mean, we don't have to look far in our own world to see how Christianity is treated. If we think to China, where religion is very oppressed there, that it's either the religion of the government or there is no religion. And Christians are forced to meet in secret and hide. And the punishment, if they're found out, is, is jail or even worse. Think about that. Where their choice really is faith or punishment. We need to learn from the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That in times like that, where it seems we're back up against the wall and there isn't any option, faith in God will get us through anything. Because God is there to rescue us, even when it seems bleak. And the way he rescues us may be different. It may, it may not be exactly like this. We may still have to suffer for our faith. We may still have to deal with the punishments that the world might hand down. But we know God will rescue us. That God will save us out of that punishment, out of that, that struggle. If that means it's eternity with him. If that means that's heaven with them, Because that's what he's promised is an eternity of rest and comfort where there is no punishment for having the faith that we need to have, where there is no, no bleak outcome for that faith. And that's a wonderful thing. If you'll now flip with me over to chapter 5. Chapter 5. Chapter 5, we're given another story about how God is, is going to rescue when it seems bleak. I, I apologize, chapter 6. I, I misspoke earlier when I said we'd be in chapter, chapter 5. But in chapter 6... We're given this story, and it's another very familiar story, just as the one we just studied, about Daniel and the lion's den. And it's another point that God rescues when it seems bleak, or, or saves when it seems bleak. If you look with me in Jan Daniel chapter 6 and read in verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the king 120 satraps. Actually, let's pause real quick. The context of this chapter is simple. Babylon has fallen to the kingdom of the Persians. And the king of the Persians is Darius. And here we see that uh, after Darius has overtaken Babylon, he's going to appoint rulers or governors of his provinces. And now, now let's continue in verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Darius is king. He is the king of Persia, and he sets up his government throughout the land of Babylon. He wants it to be ruled in a way that needs to be ruled, that he likes. And what we see is he's setting up his kingdom with 120 governors. He also sets three high officials to, to rule over those governors. And what we see is Daniel is made one of those high officials. Now, I think it's good for us to pause here, to think about Daniel and his journey in his life. As a young man, he's captured and taken to Babylon as a, a captive to learn as a eunuch, to, to learn in the officials or the court of Babylon. And from there, that kingdom is then overtaken and captured by Persia. And even in that dark time, Daniel is still seen as this honorable and hardworking man, and he's set up over the, the, high, the satraps as one of the high officials. But not only that, we saw in verse 4, that the king, or verse 3, I apologize, the king was going to set Daniel over everyone, presumably second to him. Man, isn't that amazing? That through all these hard times and difficult circumstances, Daniel is just continuing to go about his life. He's trusting in God. He's doing God's will, and he's just making the best of all his opportunities. And what we see is that in verse 3, there's an excellent spirit within him. Maybe that's a spirit of determination. 
Maybe that's a spirit of, of humility and obedience. Maybe that's a, a spirit of just honor and reverence. But whatever it is, it's a spirit that sets him apart from the rest of the people. And that makes other people jealous. His character, his success breathes this kind of jealousy in the other officials and the other satraps. And they look to him and they, they just start to wonder, well, how can we beat him? How can we tear him down? And they try to find fault in him. But there is no fault in Daniel. Now, I, I think we need to look at that and see such a wonderful, wonderful lesson. That in Daniel, no one can find a fault. With Daniel, no one can look at him and say, man, that's just crazy. He, he's, he's messed up here or he's messed up there and we can trip him up on that. That everything he does is good. Everything he does is right. And they come to this final conclusion in verse 5. That the only way they'll be able to trip up Daniel is to attack his faith. Is to attack his connection with God. Now, I don't know about you, but to think that it, it, someone might think of you or me and say, you know, I'd love to find a fault in so-and-so, but the only way I can find a fault is if I attack their faith. That would be a wonderful, wonderful statement of character. That would be a wonderful statement that, that we have been working hard on our faith and, and setting ground rules and living by those rules. That someone might look at us and say, the only way we can find fault in them is if we attack their belief in God. That would be a, a wonderful statement. It may not be, be pleasant to think about or think about how they might attack that, but it would be a wonderful statement of our own resolve and our own trust that God is there even when it seems like nothing is going right. But anyways, as we get back to this story, we see that these officials are so jealous that they come up with this plan to Darius. They come up with a plan to, to ensnare Daniel and to, trade, to, to trip him up. Look with me in verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the, lin, the den of lions. Do you see what they're doing? They come up with this plan, right? They, they come up with this plan to attack Daniel. To They know we'll trip him up. But the way they present it to the king is genius. I mean, there, there really is another way to describe it. They go before the king, and we have to understand that kings in this time, especially in Persia or Babylon and later in Greece and Rome, are all about their ego. We saw that with Nebuchadnezzar. It's the same here with Darius. And they, they use that to their advantage. They go before him and say, Oh, king, live forever. Praise be to the king. Praise be to you. And then they go on with this plan to say, well, king, you know what would be really great? If you made a decree that no one say anything or worship anybody other than you, because you, king, are, are just that good. In these times, kings are often thought about as gods among men, that they've been appointed by the gods, they've been are, are raised to power because of the gods. And here they're saying, well, you know, I think it's time that we worship you, that we, we praise you for 30 days, give you your due, King Darius, and that if anyone who does it others, well, they'll just be thrown in the den of lions. And, it, I mean, wouldn't that sound great? Wouldn't that be great to, to sit there and think, man, my whole kingdom is praising me. Everyone under my power is just looking at me and thinking, that guy is wonderful. And it works. I mean, Darius' ego is fed. He listens and he signs this decree and enacts this wicked plan. But there's one thing about this plan. Once he enacts it, it can't be taken away. Due to, to old laws of the Medes and the Persians, that law is no longer able to be erased or amended or anything like that. And he does it anyway. He's not really thinking ahead. And so this plan goes into place. No one can worship or, or praise or pray to any god or any man unless it's Darius the Persian. Now what we see in verse 10 is that Daniel hears this. In verse 10 it says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. These men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Daniel knows that this law has been made. He knows of it. 
but it doesn't bother him. In fact, he not only does he know that the new law is there, but he continues to do as God desires. He prays three times a day. Not only does he pray, but he's praying towards the holy city of Jerusalem. He's praying towards his home, where God resides in his temple, or where he did when the temple was erected. And here we see Daniel doesn't, doesn't think twice about it. He kneels and prays to God three times a day, as was his custom, as was what he had done his whole entire life. And it's not going to change just because of the law. And as he's praying, as he's making petition, these men, these, these wicked men walk by and see it. And they know they've got Daniel. They knew what he would do. And they knew that they have finally caught him. So what they do then is they, they take this plan. And they, they made it their own. And they, they notice Daniel disobeying it. And they bring it before Darius. They go before him and they say, didn't you, king, sign this law that said no one could pray? No one can make a petition to anyone other than you. And, and he goes, well, yeah, I, I know that. I, I know I made that. And they say, well, let me tell you something. Daniel, the exile, the one who is from Judah, ignores you, king. He, he doesn't pay any attention to you and prays to his own God three times a day. Man, they're, they're pretty good with their words. They're pretty good with how they bring it forward. They, they bring it forward as this exile, this one who's not even their own people is disobeying and ignoring him, that he doesn't even care about the king of Persia who's in charge of him. You know, this high official that Darius holds in such high regard doesn't care for the king. He's praying to his own God. They're pretty good with how they word it. And yet when Darius hears this, he is sorrowful. He recognizes what he's done and he tries his best to free Daniel. In verse 14, the king who, who when he heard these words was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king, and said to the king, Know, O king, that this is a law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. Darius is caught in between a rock and a hard place. He loves Daniel. He, he doesn't want to do this. He sees he's made a mistake. He hasn't thought it through, and, and here he goes, and... and he can't change it now. And not only can he not change it, but these officials come in and rub salt in the wound. They come in and tell the king, hey, just remember, this is a law of the Medes and the Persians, and you can't change it. This has to be done. It has to be carried out. And so sadly, sorrowfully, Darius does what needs to be done. In verse 16, if you'll read with me. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. Then the king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing may be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to, brought to him, and sleep fled to him, fled from him. Then at the break of the day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. So what we see from, from this story of how it begins or how it continues, is that Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. There's no other way for Darius to do it. He has to follow his decree. And so he does it. He throws his, his most trusted official, the one advisor he was going to put above his kingdom, uh, above everyone except for himself, into the lion's den. But in verse 18, or verse 17, or verse 16, as he's doing it, he, he makes a cry. He says, may your God deliver you. May your God, who you serve continually, deliver you. He's praying right there. He prays to God, saying, deliver your servant who continues to serve you no matter what. And on top of this, Darius goes into his home, his palace, and fasts throughout the entire night. He doesn't eat, and he spends it worshiping God, and thinking about what's going on, and praying to God, asking for help. He can't sleep because of what he's thinking about Daniel. And in the morning, he rushes to the den and finds that Daniel has been saved. Look with me in verse 20. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, 
because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, king, who I have done no harm. Daniel's been saved. God has heard the pleas and rescued when it seems bleak. He came and sent an angel to Daniel, who shut the lion's mouth. They couldn't harm him. And Darius, when he hears this, when he comes down and, and is thinking of the worst and just cries out in anguish and in pain to see if Daniel will cry out. Here's a wonderful thing. Daniel's voice. And the first thing Daniel says is praise to the king. He says, oh, king, live forever. He recognizes that, that love that Darius has for him, that he is concerned and worried about his, his friend, his, his trusted advisor. But then he praises God. He says, my God has done this. My God has saved me. Because he found me blameless before him and before you. I have not done anything to harm you. The king is exceedingly glad. He, he commands Daniel immediately to be raised out of this den. He's saved and he's, he's found without any harm. Again, think back to, to the furnace where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are brought out without any type of, of sign that they had been in a furnace. Daniel's brought out of the lions and without any type of sign that he was once in there. And upon this, upon this, this act of trust in God, he has been saved. As soon as this happens, as soon as Daniel brings out, or Daniel is brought out by Darius, Darius then punishes the other officials and praises God. He brings those officials who so maliciously accused Daniel and threw him into that lion's den. But not only them, but their families as well. Which is a sad and sorrowful thing, but it's a punishment for their wickedness. And those den of lions who God, who God had, had shut their mouths destroy those wicked people. And Darius goes on to, to praise that he makes a decree that in his royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, because he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to, an end, to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Darius praises God. He says, God, you are the living God and you endure forever. Your kingdom endures forever. You have saved your servant. You have rescued and delivered him. It's so wonderful to see this. Again, it's like Nebuchadnezzar where they, they see these acts of God's power and authority and mercy and they're in awe. And stand there and praise God for what he's done. God saves when it seems bleak. We see that in this story. And we see it in the story in chapter 3. And so it, we, we need to take some time to, to think about our own lives. How does this happen in our own world? Well, we can see that from this, 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 these stories, our faith can be an example to those around us. Look at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their faith was the number one thing in their lives. Nothing was going to separate them from that. And they, they took it to the test of death. That in that faith, or in those, those moments where everything seemed bleak, they weren't going to part with their trust in God. They weren't going to part in their worship of God and just stop doing it for, for their own salvation. Because they trusted that no matter what, God was the right way. And I think we can use that too, that, that when we look at this, their example of faith can be what our example of faith can be towards others. That in those moments of bleak bleakness or, or trials or tests, our faith can be that, that example that helps someone else get through their own trials. They look over and see brother so-and-so standing strong in their faith of it, a sickness or, or the loss of a job or, or just uncertainty in, in where their future lies. And they think, well, my faith should be that strong. I need to work on that. We can see that, that tests of faith require strong foundations from this. If I'm, if I'm supposed to stand strong in the face of, of doom or where things seem bleak because of my faith, if I want my faith to overcome it and resolve to, to stay true to God, my foundation before that trial needs to be firm. I need to be working on my faith before that even ever happens. That way when it does happen, when, when I lose a job, when I have to deal with a sickness either in me or in my family, when I have to deal with death or, or the loss of someone to the world or towards sin, then my foundation of faith needs to be already built strong so that I can stand strong and stand tall, knowing that God will save me and do what's right always. 
And finally, we have to understand from both of these stories that persecution should be prepared for. Both of these stories show a very sad but real fact. Faith is persecuted. And it's a sad but real fact that carries on to the New Testament where after Jesus, or even during Jesus' time, faith is persecuted. They crucify Jesus for what he's saying. They, they martyr Christians after he dies because of their faith. And today, while we don't face imminent death or doom, we face our own persecution, mockings, ostracization, social outcasting. And while those may not sound as, as scary or frightful, they take a toll on our faith just like anything else. And if we're not prepared for that, if we're not prepared for persecution, and if we're not prepared that one day we may have those religious freedoms we so value in our own country taken away from us, then when they come, we're going to fall by the wayside. We'll see those doom and gloom, that bleak out, out, or those bleak trials and say, that's not for me, you know, I think I'll just live as you guys want me to live. When we need to be standing up for our faith and uttering that same thing, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that even if God chooses not to save me from this trial, I still know he's my God and I will go to my death celebrating him as the God of everything. These stories are, are wonderful stories. They're meant to encourage us and uplift us, to lead us to, to stronger faith and better resolution in our faith. And I think when we see that, we can look at our own faith and see where we need to grow. Do, not, do I need to pray more? Do I need to study more in the Bible to help answer some questions that I need to answer? Do I need to talk to fellow disciples to see their stories, what they've dealt with and how they've overcome it through God? And we can ask these questions and find ways to build our faith until we have a faith that rivals that of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so that when those moments come, we know we will stand strong and, and faithful in the sight of bleakness. I appreciate you for, for joining us tonight and joining us in this study of Daniel. I hope that you'll continue to join us for our services on Sunday when we meet to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper and to again glance into God's Word and see what we can take away from it. And I hope you'll join us next week as can, we continue this study in the book of Daniel. I hope you have a blessed week.